few announcements before we get going. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to go be back to normal. The bus will run. We'll have uh, classes. So uh, we'll be back to normal. And then Sunday, everything will be normal as usual on that from now until something else happens. <laughs> And then uh, I mentioned this morning, Keith Parker will be here the 13th through the 16th uh, for our spiritual growth seminar, so don't forget that. Uh, and I announced this morning about Alvin Leach. Uh, he was moved back to ICU because of a regular heartbeat, and he's been put on heart medication. And I forgot to mention this morning that uh, Roy Walker uh, Kathy talked to Dennis, his son, Saturday, and he's continuing to improve pretty well over the COVID, but pneumonia is still a problem, and Dennis said that he's, he's going to be uh, weak and he's going to need some uh, 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 care from uh, in a nursing home facility for a while on that. So continue to remember Roy in your prayers also. That's all the updates I've got on six. Does anybody else have anything? If you would, bow with me as we begin our services. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thankful and grateful for this opportunity to gather, to study your word and fellowship amongst brethren. We ask that you continue to be with those that are sick, that are in the hospital, that are dealing with COVID and um, other illnesses that are uh, keeping them from us here. We ask that you continue to be with us all as it's, it's just a time of turmoil and confusion in our country and in our world. And I ask for your strength that we may be a shining light and point people in your direction during this time because we know that you're the one that can heal us and, and make things right. I ask tonight as we go through this study that uh, we turn our attention to you and we can apply it as we go through the next week. Keep us all safe as we leave from here tonight, but we ask that uh, you would bring those that are away from us back to us when they can. Just be with us as we go through this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's make sing. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life. Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time. And Lord of all the Lord you will be. We bow down.
We'll see. Yeah. I will serve you. We'll see this through a couple of times, and then we'll turn the services over to Adam this afternoon. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your love is what I long for. You have given life to me. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, maybe you saw this morning on uh, on the email. I sent out the bulletin. I also added two different prayer requests. Uh, one was for uh, Brian Crawford. He's on his way to Louisiana uh, to help with the storm. So remember him and his crew and your prayers. And, and as we mentioned this morning, all the people who are affected by the storm. Uh, also, I heard from Julie Pinkerton, and they had another positive test there in their uh, assisted living facility, and and she just, uh, right before the service, sent me a new message saying that even her, uh, her roommate was exposed. So um, just be remembering uh, the people there at, in Sullivan, Missouri. Uh, be remembering uh, Julie uh, as you go about your week. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, that's mostly where we're going to be here this evening. You might have heard of Biden 2020 or Trump 2020, but maybe you haven't heard of Jesus 2020. Two ladies in the small town of Raymer, Alabama, launched the Jesus 2020 campaign, which is putting up yard signs all over the nation. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't running for the presidency of the United States. That would be quite a demotion for the king of kings. But the purpose here is, is people are trying to give hope to people through the COVID-19 pandemic and really the general negativity in our country. One of the women that started it said, people need Jesus with everything that's going on. He's the only one we can count on. He's the only one who keeps his promises. He's already the winner. With the help of Facebook, the movement has spread. More than 5,000 signs have been shipped to states like California, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas, all according to the yellowhammernews.com. 
This got me thinking how awesome it would be to have Jesus as our present. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, he, was so, he would be someone that you can always trust is going to make the right choice. He would be someone you could trust would always make the right decision and or take the right action. He is someone you know that, that beyond the shadow of a doubt, he would always try to bless every single individual in our land. It would be awesome to be able to vote for someone like that. The thing is, we do have an option to vote for Jesus. No, I'm not talking about writing in, him in on November 3rd. But we as Christians, every single day, have an option. If we are going to elect Jesus as the true king, not just of the United States, but of all of our lives. We have that choice to elect him as our ruler. Sadly... Myself included, we as Christians sometimes fail to do that. That we reject the one we, we could trust to make the right choice. That we can trust to take the right action. That we can trust to try and bless every single one of us. Sometimes we reject the very one that could do so much for us as our ruler in our lives. And if there's one group of people that should have known that God was, was the leader that they could trust, the leader they could trust to be benevolent and righteous to them, it would have been the Israelites who were delivered out of slavery in Egypt. God proved himself that he was worthy to be followed time and time again for these people. He had led them out of, of slavery through the ten plagues. He had guided them by a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He had saved them from the Egyptians by allowing them to walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. When they got to the other side, he used the sea to crush the Egyptians who were following after them. He was one who, who made great promises to them, gave them a great law, and had the hope before them that they would have a land that was flowing with milk and honey. God proved time and time again to these people that he was going to be benevolent towards them. He was going to bless them and give them grace upon grace. If there's anyone that should have acknowledged that and elected him as their leader, it should have been this people. However, what we find in number 16 is that there was someone who announced their candidacy and their candidacy against God. His name was Kor. He was a Levite and he recruited a, a few guys named Abiram and Dothan and On, as well as about 250 people who were well-respected leaders among the, the congregation to come up and oppose Moses and Aaron as the leaders of Israel. These were their complaints. Their complaints, first of all, was that Moses and Aaron had exalted themselves over the nation. They made the case that every single one of us is holy before God. They are just as holy as we are, and they have exalted themselves over the congregation they had exalted themselves to be rulers of us all. But that was the first complaint. The second complaint they had against Moses and Aaron was that Korah, though he was a Levite, he was not a part of the priesthood. Not every Levite was a priest. Some worked and ministered in the tabernacle and later the temple. But the, the idea of being a priest was only left up to the sons of Aaron. So Kor was not a son of Aaron, so he was not a part of the priesthood, but he thought he should have been. And finally, the third complaint they had was that Moses had brought the people out of a land flowing with milk and honey into this wilderness to kill them, which is kind of funny to think about. You know, we always think about Canaan's land, the land flowing with milk and honey. But they were looking back to their, their previous life there in Egypt in slavery, and they said that land was flowing milk and honey. And you've taken us from that good thing back in Egypt, brought us out here just to kill us. And so here they oppose Moses and Aaron and their, their leadership, and, and really this is a mutiny to, to take over the leadership of the people. However, what we find in this passage was that their, their complaint really wasn't just against Moses and Aaron. It was really against God. Look there in number 16, in verse 11, this is where uh, 
Moses says here, Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. He says it's against the Lord. They rebelled not just against Moses and Aaron and their leadership. They were rebelling against God. And that really makes sense if you think about it, because their complaint was that, that Moses and Aaron had exalted themselves over the congregation. But if you think about Moses when he was called by God to be the leader of the people, we see for certain that Moses did not want to have that job. He was not intending to exalt himself over anyone. He didn't want to be the leader at all, and he made all these excuses to show that he did not want to be that leader. So it wasn't Moses who exalted him. It said he was God's choice to lead the people. When you think about uh, Moses and Aaron with the, the priesthood, that was not something that they had chosen. It was something that they delivered through revelation from God. It was God who made the choice that, that the sons of Aaron would be the ones who would be the priest. It was nothing that, that Moses and Aaron were doing. Really, their complaint wasn't against Moses and Aaron. Really, their complaint was against God himself. And so here we see that they were complaining against God. They were rebelling against God and his choice for the people. And that's something I think we are very familiar with. It's easy for us sometimes when God chooses something to, to bump up against that. To say, I, I don't agree with that. I don't want to submit to that. Just think about how some people uh, bump up against the leadership of the church from time to time. That sometimes they don't want to submit to the elders who are living in a very individualistic society. We, we don't submit ourselves to their spiritual direction. And we say, well, we can just do it on our own. We don't need them. What we're doing, we're, we're saying that God's choice, that, that godly leadership is not for me. Some in our day and time have pushed back against the... Um, the male-led uh, assembly of the Lord's church. People have pushed up against that, that men are chosen to be the leaders in public worship. And so they have pushed up against that and said that men aren't the only ones qualified, that women can also lead as well. Sometimes we bump up against that when God shows us certain uh, qualities and characteristics of elders and deacons. And, and sometimes we we kind of class with that, and we think to ourselves, that's not right that God would disqualify people who don't have children or disqualify those who are not married. And so we're, we're upset that God made a choice. So many times we're not pleased with the choice that God has made for us, and we rebel against him, rebel against his choice for us. Now, I think it's important for us to note in this passage that, that it is very likely that Korah and his, his three friends and the 250 leaders, it's, it's very likely that they were very capable leaders. In fact, there in verse 2 of chapter 16, it says that these, these men were really, really well known and, and handpicked from the congregation. It says they rose up before Moses with a number of people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. These probably were the leaders of, of a, of a lot of the congregation of God's people. They were probably very capable leaders. But that's not the question. The question is not whether they can do the job, if they can do it even better than Moses and Aaron. And, and we know that Moses and Aaron, they had their faults for sure. But that wasn't the question. Really, the question is, what did God choose? And God chose Moses and Aaron. He didn't choose Kor. He didn't choose the three others. He didn't choose the 250. God made a choice, and they should have respected that. That's something I think we struggle with a lot. And, and we, as humans, have struggled with it from the very beginning, right? If you think back to Adam and Eve, really their choice, their choice was to say, our choice is going to be better than God's choice. That the God has, yes, he's chosen there would be one tree that we not eat from. And they disregarded God's choice. They rebelled against his authority. And because of that, they were punished. But we see the same thing happens to Korah and his, his fellow rebels. We see with Korah, Korah and the 250 that, that they were burning incense before the Lord. And, 
And the Lord consumed them with the fire. We also see with Dathan and Abiram and, and the elders of the congregation that they were in a certain spot. And God just opened up the earth and swallowed them up, closed it back over them. God judged them for their rebellion. I judged them because their complaint really wasn't with Moses and Aaron. It was really against God and his choice for the people. Now, if you like death, you're going to see a little bit more here in this next passage. Because in the aftermath of these judgments of, of the, uh, the rebel, rebels here, what we find here is the congregation thinks that, that Moses and Aaron have gone too far and they should not have have allowed these people to be judged in this way. So verse 41 there of chapter 16 says this, But on the next day all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. And so here we find that these people again are grumbling, and they're grumbling right again, right at Moses and Aaron. They're pointing the finger at them. They're not pointing at God. But they're pointing at them and saying, how could you have killed all of these people? They just can't understand. And so here what we find is that, that again, they're not just rebelling against God's choice. But in this instance, they're, they're rebelling against God's action. And I think sometimes we can get that way too. Sometimes we look at our life and it doesn't turn out the way we want it to. And so we look at God and, and we point the finger and say, what are you doing? Why is my life not turning out the way I want it to? How in the world are you, are you allowing my relative to suffer? Why in the world won't you do, about, do something about this injustice in our land? Sometimes we look at God and say, why aren't you acting the way I want you to act? And I believe in, in the, the midst of this, this thought process, what we're really doing to God is saying, I could be a better ruler than you. I could be a better king than you. He's saying, that what often we say to God is that we are better fit to be the king of kings than the king of kings himself. Many times we rebel against God's action and what he has done for us. Even though we acknowledge that God has been very good to us, sometimes we get in those spots where we think, God, what are you doing? point the finger at him, and we grumble and complain against the king of kings. But what we find in this passage, again, is that God judges the people. He judges the people for their rebellion. They, he judges people for their, their desire to elect themselves as king over him. We see that God sends a plague, and, and after the plague's over, there's about 14,700 people who are dead. In this aftermath. I think when we see this judgment, we need to see that as a warning for ourselves. That when we do not trust in God's choices, when we do not trust in God's actions, what we're doing is we're electing ourselves to be king over him, and we're putting ourselves in a very precarious spot before the holy God of all. Because what we find in the scriptures is that rebellion Rebellion will not be tolerated before God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, we read in verse 4 that, that God did not even spare the angels when they sinned against God, but instead he cast them into this place of torment and these chains of gloomy darkness to await the judgment. If God will not even tolerate rebellion against his angels, we need to understand that he is more than willing to judge us for our rebellion too. But, but what was their sin? Why did God judge these angels? We'll look down to verses 9 and 10. It says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the flesh of defiling passion and, look at this one, despise authority. Despise authority. Authority. These angels, they despised the authority of God. Because of that, they were judged for it. So why is Peter telling us this? Why is he writing this to the churches? Well, verse 6 shows us. It says, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, 
making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. When we do not respect God's authority, we can expect God's wrath. Flip over with me to Jude, the book of Jude. Here, Jude is addressing the, the false teachers that were in their midst. And one of the things that, that these false teachers were accused of here in verse 8 is that they reject authority. That's part of their condemnation, is because they reject authority before the Lord. Then in verse 11, he, he uses our passage back in Numbers 16 as an example. And he says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. He's using this imagery from Numbers chapter 16 and other places in the Old Testament. He says, you're going to suffer the same woes as them. He says, woe to them if you reject and despise the authority of the Lord. And so for us, if we reject God's action, if we reject his choices, if we try to make ourselves king over the king of kings, we need to expect God's wrath. The problem, though, with that is that we all, from time to time, re rebel against God's choice and his commandments and his actions. In fact, sin itself, if you think about it, is really a rebellion against God. We're saying, God, I'm going to do it my way and not your way. I think I know better for my life uh, what I need versus what you think is best for my life. So essentially every single sin is us rebelling against the Lord. And we need to understand that we deserve God's wrath because of that. However, even in the midst of being rebels, there is hope for us. Just as there was hope there in Numbers chapter 16. Look there in, in verses 46 through 48, 46 through 48, we see that Moses and Aaron sees the plague going on around him in the congregation. And look what they do. Starting in verse 46, it says, Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put fire in it from off the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. So Aaron took it, as Moses said, and, and ran in the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague already began, already had begun among the people. And he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Here what we have is, is Moses and Aaron working on behalf of the people to stop the wrath. So he sends this high priest, Moses sends this high priest to make offerings and atonement for the people, to stand between the living, those who were, who were living, and those who were dying from the plague, to stand between them to save the people. To me, that just reminds me of our great high priest, Jesus Christ, who stood between eternal life and eternal death. He stood there so that he could save us, save, save us from our own wrath of God that we deserve. Save us from the plague to come. And there he made atonement by dying on the cross for our sins. But what's even more significant about this is just who Moses and Aaron and, and later Jesus did this for. If you think about Moses and Aaron, you have this, this congregation. And verse 41 makes it clear. It's all the congregation. Everyone was against him. All Israel was against Moses and Aaron. And if I were in their spot and I, I would see God judging these people for that rebellion, for that rejection of authority, to be honest, I might just kind of sit back and, and watch the fireworks, okay? It would have been very easy for them to, 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 to really want vengeance to happen on these people, to be vindictive for, for what they had done by rebelling against them and grumbling against them time and time again. You can imagine how easy it would be to say, God, just, just have your way with them. Take them all out. They would not allow that to happen. They worked quickly. And it even says, take this, this incense and, and do it immediately, Aaron. He wanted to stop as many people from being killed as possible. And to me, that just shows me about Moses and Aaron. 
Yeah, they might not have been the best of leaders, and we know they had faults. They might not have been the best and the most capable leaders among them, but, but really by this, this desire to, to really swallow their pride, swallow their ego, and work for the very people who were rebelling against them is, is so amazing to me. To want to save the very people who despised you and your authority. That's what they were doing. That's, that's amazing that they had that heart. That, that even though they might not be the most capable leaders, they certainly were the right leaders for Israel. Because they cared about the people they were leading. And they worked, even when they did them wrong, worked for their own lives. I hope you can see the parallel between us and Jesus. That we, even though we were rebels against Christ, he was willing to die for each one of us. Romans chapter 5, verses 7 through 9 says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person we would have even dared to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more we, uh, shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We were still sinners. We were still ungodly. We were still rebels against God. But Jesus, he stood in that gap. He stood between life and death and made atonement for each one of us. Isaiah chapter 53, we read part of it this morning in, in Jeremy's uh, words before the Lord's Supper. I want to highlight verse 6 because I think it really speaks about the rebellion that we all do before God. And it speaks about what God does for us. It says in verse 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've decided that we don't need a shepherd. We're going to be independent sheep. But then it says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus, Jesus came to this earth to die for people who despise his authority came to die for the very rebels who were going to kill him. He did that for us. And I, I just can't help but think in the midst of, of his benevolence, his grace towards us, when we didn't deserve his grace, he gave it. I can't help but think, not only do we need to submit to Jesus because he is the king of kings, because he is the right hand of God, because God has given all authority in heaven and earth. Not only should we submit to him because he is the king of kings, but he has proven himself towards each one of us that he is worthy to be submitted to. He is worthy to be our leader by his grace for us. While we were yet rebels, he died for us in our rebellion. And so as we look at Jesus and think about Jesus, we need to view him as a leader that is worth submitting to. Not just every four years, but we need to submit to him every moment of every day. And elect him as our king. To trust his actions and his choice for our lives. Trust that he is trying to bless us even when we don't understand his actions. Even when we don't understand his choices. We have to trust in him. Humble ourselves. And submit to his will. And if we do that, if we do humble ourselves and say, Lord, you are king. I am bowing down before the king of kings. And you're going to be the Lord of my life. You're going to be the ruler of my life. I believe we have this beautiful promise in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. And that is, if we humble ourselves before the Lord and his mighty hand, one day he will lift you up. One day he will exalt you. And we know that for sure because at the end of verse 8 it says, For he cares for you. See, we serve a righteous and benevolent leader. One that is worthy not just of our, our vote, but he's worthy of our lives each day. And I hope that all of us can learn more and more each day to accept his action in our life. To accept his choices to accept him as the king of our all and the king of our lives. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we are so grateful, Lord, that even in our rebellious state, we turn our backs on you and, and choose our own way and, 
and choose not to follow you as our shepherd, that, that you have still chosen to lay the iniquity, our iniquity, on Jesus. That you were willing to send Jesus to stand between the living and the dead to make atonement for us so that we do not endure your wrath, but that we might be saved in Jesus. Thank you, O oh Lord, for what you have done. And based upon what you've done, Lord, help us have gratitude that just overrides our hearts. Where in all things, in all choices that you make, in all actions that you make, that we submit to you. That we humble ourselves before you. That we honor you each day as the King of Kings. Help us, Lord, each day to do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone here this evening that needs to respond to the invitation. Uh, we would love to help you and walk with you, whatever it might be. Please come forward as we stand and sing our invitation song. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's sea fight. Things that were higher, things that were nobler, these have the
nervous, afraid of the goings on of this world, dear Lord. We pray that soon everyone will realize that you are the only hope that we have in this life. We pray that soon we can all meet together again to worship you. Lord, as we leave here this evening, may we continue to keep our thoughts upon you throughout this week that people that we meet we come across in this life will know that we are Christian by our actions, not just our words. Lord, we pray that when this world is over that you'll forgive us of our many sins and that we can have a life with you forever. In Christ's name.